In 2012, I had suffered a stroke that killed me. As I slipped away, I had felt an overwhelming peace come over me like I had never felt before. Things went black. Then I was ascending above, and I saw the city below. Next to me I heard a voice from this orb of varied colored lights that also had a mist coming off of it. It was a woman's voice, and she was telling me how excited she was to finally be with her family and see her mom and dad again. I started to feel unsure and told her I wasn't supposed to be here. Suddenly I was standing in an otherworldly place that was gorgeous. All the structures and buildings were made of what looked similar to marble but it had an iridescent color between the marbling. The buildings were decorated with colorful stones with golden bezelments lining the buildings and glass fencing. I walked along the path with my arms crossed and holding to my body. I felt lost and everyone around me was chattering happily with each other in these otherworldly clothes of satin-like linens. Some people held hands and were close and joyful with each other. This place was absolutely beautiful. I came upon an old man who was sitting near a tree and would seem to be teaching a class with people surrounding him. Some were sitting and others were standing. He called me over to join him. He was teaching the lessons of what life is supposed to be on earth, what it was originally supposed to be and how humans were supposed to be caring for the world and the inhabitants on it, but materialism had gotten in the way among other things. I felt an overwhelming knowledge come over me as he continued to teach this class about the world, the universe, life and death. Everyone began to surround me and the old man put his hand on my shoulder and he said, It's not your time yet. You will know when it is. The people from the class all came in and held me in a circle and I was suddenly back. I opened my eyes and breathed in. I was alive and back in my earthly body. And this is how I came to believe in God and also reincarnation. I don't claim a religion because my beliefs are now a mix of things. Unfortunately, slowly that knowledge that was instilled into me slowly slipped away over the years, but I feel it in the back of my mind. To me, religion became several fingers pointing to the same being. I don't need a religion to dictate my relationship with God. If you're wondering, I'm 27 now and suffer of residual effects that disabled me, but I keep going. My body may not work properly, but my brain still does and... I focus on expanding my knowledge in various areas. I live in a relatively new building. It was built about 10 years ago, so you'd expect to be no ghosts or weird things around. Everything is electrical, including the boiler. Gas-powered anything is very uncommon where I live. I also don't have any pets that I could have tripped over or have any furniture in the hallway between my bedroom and bathroom. Anyway, one night, I abruptly woke up at about 3am, really needing to use the bathroom. Bearing in mind that it's almost pitch black in my apartment, I was barely able to see the outline of my hand in front of my face. I managed to stumble out of my room and towards the bathroom. On the way, I bump into something right beside the bathroom door. I distinctly remember looking at it and thinking, Huh? That looks like a person crouched down on the floor. I brushed it off as my dad leaving the vacuum cleaner in the hallway and I just tripped over it and continued to the bathroom. Then I remembered that my dad didn't leave the vacuum cleaner in the hallway. He put it away behind a locked door in the third bedroom over concern that my mother might trip over it and hurt herself. I rushed to flick the lights on and turn around to look at whatever I tripped over that was in the hallway. There was nothing there. Yesterday I had a weird experience on Halloween night, so I wanted to post it here. In 2015, my mom passed away from cancer. Since her death, we made a family tradition to visit her grave every Halloween night to memorialize her. We would go to worship in the church and then light a candle on her grave. This year, the church was closed and my brother was sick, so me and my dad decided to visit her grave alone. We drove out at 9pm. The graveyard was completely dark, no lights on the graves. But then we got over to my mom's grave. The lights were lit. We knew it was my grandma who had visited her and lit the candles. We sadly lost contact with her after my mom's death. 
We lit up our own candles and looked at her grave in silence. I felt comfort watching her grave. I wasn't scared, but it was sad to see all the other graves with no lights. I was surprised the candles didn't blow out. It was a windy night and they were out in the open. Suddenly I heard a quiet sound coming from my side. It was completely dark so I couldn't see anything, but after hearing the sound the second time I could hear it was a cat. I sat down on the ground trying to find the cat. I could hear it was close to me. My dad just watched. He knew I loved cats so he wasn't surprised I wanted to pet it. The cat was very happy and wanted to be pet so I started to pet him and then he crawled into my lap. I just sat in silence petting the cat and watching the grave. My mom loved cats too. She loved their cat at home. He sat in her bed looking out for her to the end. Then my dad said that maybe it was a cat my mom had sent to tell us it would all be okay. The moment was beautiful. My dad turned on the light on his phone and we could see it was a black cat. A black cat on Halloween night visiting my mom's grave. I continued to pet him on my lap and after some time he crawled down. But then the cat walked over to my mom's grave, crawled over the little fence and just stood on the grave, the exact place her urn was buried. The cat turned around and looked at both of us with his glowing eyes. I could feel my mom's presence as I looked into the cat's eyes and even though I don't believe in the afterlife, this felt so real. It felt like a sign from my mother. After standing there for some time talking about memories from my mom, we decided to get home. But the cat followed us as we walked away. I sat down to pet him, but then it crawled in my lap again. My dad continued to walk to the car. He thought I was right behind him, but I couldn't let go of the cat. I felt a connection. The cat was so warm, so happy, and then I started to burst into tears. I haven't cried a lot over my mom. I don't know why, but at this moment I couldn't keep it in anymore. I know it sounds crazy, but I felt like the cat was connected to my mother. I hugged the cat tight and gave it a nose kiss. My dad had realized I wasn't behind him and came back for me. He heard me crying and came to comfort me. He knew I wasn't ready to let go of the cat, but he took my hand and we went to the car. I knew I couldn't stay there forever. It was very cold and dark. I'm happy I had the experience, because it felt comforting and beautiful. I felt a connection to my mom. This is not the first time I got a sign from her like this, but that is for another post. Pingu was an Indian stray dog. On a rainy day evening, he, as a pup then, followed me to my home. He was plump and cute for a stray and I had a fight with my mom to keep him. As years passed he became a hunk amongst dogs and had many lady friends. Going for a run used to be our favorite time pass. After he became the hunk I used to see him taking small pups for a run. Being inside a closed community I never tied him down and he had all the freedom. No wonder most of the pups resembled him. Time ran fast for him and soon he was an oldie. He would come and be around my house and I used to feed him, caress him, powder his itchy body and he would simply lie down and enjoy it. When the summer vacation came I was sent to my uncle's place in Bangalore for a good one month. Pingu used to follow me to the bus shelter on the main road whenever I used to go somewhere. This time also he had come to see me off. When I returned I found him by the bus shelter and though found it strange thought it could be a coincidence. He looked way healthy from the time he came to see me off. I made fun of him, saying he could father a couple more pups. He walked with me in his playful self. The memories of him following me as a pup kept rushing back to me. He followed me till a certain point near my house. I kept looking for him as I neared my house, but he was gone. I didn't mind it, as he was usually like that. He would go off behind one of his girlfriends, or would go off to train some pups, and then would always come back to my place to crash. This time it was different. At night he didn't come back and I couldn't find his plate in the bed outside my house. I asked my mother but she skipped it tactfully. Next day when I tried to take a new bowl for him she stopped me and told me he had died while I was away. I told her that was a lie. I could just tell her about the day before. She told me that he was buried under a jackfruit tree not far from my house. 
the place where he had vanished the day before. To this day, I could not make out what it was, and I have never seen him afterwards. So this happened to me about two years back, and I've never had any sort of explanation. I was meditating on my bed with the lights off and my eyes closed. Once I finished and opened my eyes, I saw this ball of light circling itself to the right side of my bed. It was mostly white, but I could see flashes of other colors too as it swirled. I was so scared I threw myself under the covers and turned away. I've never seen anything like it before. About five to ten minutes later, when I looked... It was gone and I never saw it again. Has anyone else ever had any similar experiences? Could it have been an entity of some kind? Or just an after effect of meditating or something like that? I'd really appreciate any insight. I bought my home in 2015. It's a three-bedroom semi-detached, built about 50 years ago here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. In 2017, my now wife and her son moved in with me. He turns three shortly, but at the time of this story, he had just turned two. We have always felt happy, secure, and safe in our home. We have wonderful neighbors. One day, they told me about the original owners. Their names were Erno and Wilhelmina. They are originally from Europe and Erno was a well-known musician in his day. Apparently Erno liked to say he was big before the Beatles came along. They were a pleasant couple who were always friendly with my neighbors. Erno and Wilhelmina passed away in 2009. Someone else owned the house for a few years before I bought it in 2015. My neighbors happened to have a CD copy of some of Erno's music. He was a talented musician who spoke several different languages. One night, after we put our toddler to bed, my wife and I listened to some of his music that our neighbors lent to us. I'm not much of a music buff, but to me, it almost sounded like jazz or swing with lots of organ accompaniment. The lead track was a happy tune called Life is a Cabaret, but that was the only English song on the CD. Nevertheless, we found it charming. I commented to my wife that it had probably been some time since these walls heard the sound of Erno's voice. Days later, my wife is at work and my toddler and I are spending the day at home. He is a very assertive little boy. We were in the bathroom together, trying to get him potty trained, still working on that one, and the door was open. He points past me to the empty hallway beyond and says what sounds to me like, No boy, stop it. I don't pay much attention to it. Toddlers have very active imaginations and the things they say don't always make much sense. Moments later, my toddler has some fresh clothes on and we are making our way back downstairs to play. As we are about to take the first step down the stairs, my toddler abruptly stops, turns around, and points back to the empty hallway behind us and again says, No boy, stop it! As if he heard someone say something he didn't like. Again, I'm hesitant to overanalyze it at this point, but something begins to feel just a little bit creepy. Downstairs, I head to the kitchen to start getting lunch ready while my boy plays with his trucks in the living room. After a few moments, I look down the short hallway to see what he's up to. I see him emerge from the living room and look up, as if though he's looking up at an adult. He then points his finger where he's looking and says, No, boy, stop it. Like I said, he's a very assertive little boy and I've seen him act like this with us before. He doesn't like being told he can't do something. Sometimes when his mother and I are acting silly, he'll do this when we're singing or dancing. I admit I was a bit unsettled after this third instance of him addressing someone who wasn't there. Yet, I chose to listen to the logical part of my brain that said toddlers don't always have a reason for the things they do and say. I carried on making lunch. I must have been running late getting lunch ready. My toddler came into the kitchen to check on my progress. I picked him up and told him he'd have to wait a bit longer. As I carried him back to the living room so he could play, he says to no one in particular, Erno, Erno, Erno. I stopped. I asked him, What did you say? He responded without hesitation, Erno. 
He didn't point anywhere and I don't recall his attention being focused in a particular direction. I should note that neither my wife nor myself recall speaking about Erno in front of her toddler before this day, but it's not impossible that he overheard one of us saying it. I still mostly feel like the events of that morning can be attributed to the overactive imagination of a growing young boy, but he's never done anything like that before or since. I haven't heard him say Erno again. My wife, my son, and I feel very safe in our home. Our toddler has never given us any indication of being scared of anything. After telling my neighbors about this day, they told me they're sure Erno and his wife are very pleased that there's a young, happy family growing in their old house. I'm inclined to agree. I stopped telling friends and family about this incident. First of all, I don't want them asking our toddler about it. I worry he will get the impression that there's something to be afraid of in our house, which there is not. Secondly, I worry he will start doing things like this just to get attention if enough people keep asking him about it. This is probably the only thing that's ever happened to me that could even remotely be twisted into a paranormal experience. My wife has never had any kind of experience like this in her house. So, did a deceased musician come to pay our toddler a visit and sing him a song in an unfamiliar language? Did our toddler tell him to stop it when he didn't recognize the words? Or are we just letting him watch too much TV? If you stuck it out and read to the end, I thank you for your attention. I welcome any thoughts on my experience. This happened several years ago when I was about nine, but hadn't thought much about it until recently. My great-grandma, who at the time was my favorite relative, had just passed away. To give some context, I'd constantly write her letters, talk on the phone, and visit as often as we could. Being nine, it was extremely hard for me when she passed. I barely remember the ride home, but we had just returned to Minnesota from the funeral in New England. I distinctly remember being in my room, on the top bunk, sobbing. My bedroom was upstairs with a bunk bed against the left wall, open on the right. I slept with my head closest to my bedroom door and my feet closest to the window. My window view faced a park across the street from my house and my house. Any traffic would travel parallel with my house and window so their headlights would never directly shine in my room. As I lied there reminiscing about the good times shared with my Gigi to my mom, a bright white light overtook and filled the entire room for a second, slowly faded back to darkness and a familiar musky scent of her perfume filled the room. I think I fell asleep shortly after that because I don't remember much else after that moment. For years, that memory would periodically pop back into my mind, but I never brought it up to my mom because as a nine-year-old, I wasn't totally sure if I was experiencing something real. Fast forward to recently, my mom and I were talking about memories as a child and brought up my Gigi. At one point, she brought up the night of her funeral and asked if I remembered anything weird from that night. When I asked what she meant, she, like me, never mentioned it because she wasn't sure if it was real and began to share the same flash of light and perfume experience and confirm my own. Shortly after confirming the event with my mom, I accidentally came upon an old gold locket with her and my picture in it. I like to think that she still comes to check in on me every so often. My parents divorced when I was very young. I do remember after the divorce that they both lived in apartments in the middle of Tennessee. Well, not long before I was about to start kindergarten, my mom remarried to my stepdad and we moved to a small house in the middle of nowhere, Alabama, about 30 miles outside of Birmingham. It was in a good school district and near my stepdad's family, who would be helping with my brand new little sister. This was actually a very exciting time for my other little sister and me. We finally had cousins, aunts and uncles, and grandparents we would get to see all the time instead of traveling for the holidays to New England or Florida only once or twice a year. We didn't even care that they were all step family. The cousins we saw most often were Brady and Micah. Their mom and our mom worked odd jobs to make ends meet and helped each other out with childcare while my stepdad worked as a truck driver and Uncle Randy worked as an EMT and ambulance driver. Our house was an odd setup. 
We lived in a little two-room house that actually sat almost right behind a large old farmhouse that no one lived in. Whenever Brady and Micah would come visit, we would always end up going through the house and always wondered why it was still set up like a house since no one lived there. The beds in the bedrooms were made, there were a couple of plates in the sink in the kitchen for the first few years. It was like someone just left for work one day and never came home. After a day of playing in the house, I found a plate in the kitchen I thought was really pretty. I knew we were about to go visit my grandparents in Florida for the summer and I thought it would be a perfect gift for my Southern Belle plate collecting grandmother. I took it back home and mom helped me clean it and get it ready that evening before sending me off to bed. After my mom sent me to bed, she followed her nightly routine of smoking a cigarette, dumping the ashtray, sweeping off the porch before locking it, then watching the nightly news before going to bed herself. While she was in bed, she kept smelling a burning cigarette. She couldn't figure out why and even got up to check the garbage to make sure her last one wasn't still lit. It wasn't. So, she went back to bed. She almost fell asleep, convinced the smell is just stuck in her nose when all the lights in her room turn on. She turns to get out of bed and comes face to face with me, standing next to her bed, clutching my blanket and crying. She asked me why I turned on all of her lights. I just break down crying and barely get the words out. I didn't turn on any of the lights, not even the ones in our room or in the living room. Caroline did it. I told her to stop and turn the lights back off, but she just laughed at me. My mom was very confused. Who's Caroline? I explained. Caroline is my friend I made. Normally she just turns on some lights at night. She didn't have lights in her house next door until she was six like me and likes to play with them. But when I tell her to stop and go home to sleep, she turns off the lights and walks away. But tonight, but, but tonight she turned on all the lights. And when I told her to stop, she laughed at me and walked into our closet instead of going home. Now she doesn't want to leave and even though I want her to, and she made fun of me. My mom got out of bed and picked me up. She was carrying me back to my room. She quickly discovered every light, every lamp, every ceiling light, even the pole chain lamp under the kitchen counter was on. She took me to my room and laid me in bed, checked the closet just to make sure Caroline wasn't in there, and turned off the bedroom lights so my sister wouldn't wake up. She went out into the hall and reached for the light switch, but... Before she could even touch it, every light in the house went off. Mom was convinced that we had lost power, so she hit the light switch to check and the hall light came back on like normal. As odd as it was, she just went back to bed. As she laid in bed, the cigarette smell came back. She sat up trying to remember if she smelled it while dealing with me or if she was just too preoccupied and freaked out to notice. While she was trying to remember, she heard the screen door to the back porch open and slam shut again. Of course she knew she had locked it before going to bed. She wasted no more time and picked up the phone and called Uncle Randy, since it was before the prevalence of cell phones and it wasn't like my stepdad would be able to make it from Arkansas back to Alabama in any time quick enough for the circumstances. For 12 minutes, my mom sat frozen in her bed, scared to move listening for any other sign of an intruder or that any of the three of us had woken up. Then she heard a car pull up into the driveway, followed by Randy banging on the screen door and yelling her name. She ran to the kitchen, threw open the back door, turned on the back porch light and immediately saw it. Between her and Randy were about 20 burnt cigarette butts and cigarette ashes strewn across the floor she had just cleaned about an hour before in a locked screen door. Every night when I'm alone in bed, I constantly keep having this feeling of being watched. I'll be laying in bed in my dark room trying to fall asleep when, out of nowhere, I'll get this feeling. I sit up slightly and scan the room in front of me and my eyes always rest on the corner of my room to my left where I'm not able to see much because of how dark it is. After that, I'll usually stare at the corner of my room for a couple of seconds before I lay my head back down on my pillow. But the weird thing is, is that sometimes I swear I'll see something in the darkness just standing there, looking at me. Now it could very well be my overactive imagination due to the countless hours I spend listening to creepypastas and diving down the rabbit holes of YouTube, 
but I'm not sure. It just creeps me out. I now always sleep with my TV on as it's my only source of possible light in my almost pitch black room. I sometimes find that my bedroom door and or closet door will be slightly cracked open at times, even though I swear to God I had the thing closed. This doesn't happen a lot with my closet, but it does happen more frequently with my room door. And yes, the latch is always inside the door frame when I close it, so there is absolutely no way you could open it without turning the knob. Has this happened to anyone else? If so, or if you've had any similar experiences, please feel free to comment. From what I can remember, I used to sleep in my parents' room very frequently as a kid due to me being scared to sleep in my own room by myself, so much so that my parents had actually moved my bed into their room so that I could sleep with them. The layout of the room was fairly simple. My bed sat in front of the doorway on the right-hand side of the room near the corner. To my left was my parents' bed and in front of them was their big wooden dresser alongside the closet. Our beds were side by side with about a foot of space in between. So now that I've gotten all that out of the way, on with the story. One day while I was in bed I found it almost impossible to fall asleep. I tossed and turned every which way but with no use. I remember laying there for a long time trying to keep my eyes closed in an attempt to will myself to sleep. I could hear my parents snoring away next to me and the sounds of an old ticking clock my mother had hung in the room on the wall opposite me. Sometime later that night, I vividly remember being on the brink of sleep when suddenly something materialized out of thin air beside my bed. It was a woman, and she was wearing a white robe with golden blonde hair and perfect fair skin. She also had an incredibly bright luminescent glow to her, as though she were a bright light shining through the otherwise dark room. The woman, or what I've come to realize must have been an angel, reached down and put her hand on my forehead, gently running her fingers through my hair. Then she says, Sleep, my child, sleep, in a calm and peaceful, echoey voice. I then very slowly closed my eyes and fell into a deep slumber. When I awoke, I found myself lying on the floor inside my own room. My mother had been the one to wake me up, as she had noticed that I wasn't in bed and found me face down on the ground, sound asleep. My mother had actually been recording me the entire time as she woke up to a tired and confused five-year-old me. She still has the videotape to this day, and she, nor do I, have any idea how I got there. Though the obvious answer would be that I had been sleepwalking, I had only done so one time before. What do you think of my experience? Have you ever seen or been visited by what you believe to be angels? Feel free to give your thoughts down below and thank you for taking the time to listen to me. When I went to college, there was a public hiking trail that lots and lots of students would go to. And of course, everyone wanted to go at night because there is a tunnel at the beginning of the trail. It's big, it runs a quarter of a mile long, and it's super creepy. The legends say that the place is haunted, and it's 110% true. The road to nowhere is believed to be haunted because the state was trying to build a road between two towns to make travel and moving produce faster. When they got all of the correct permits, many of the people who owned the land were Native Americans and poor farmers. After taking their land and rendering many people homeless, and mind you, this place is full of old families, so they uprooted people who had generations and generations of people living there. They actually never finished building the road, and this is obviously where the name The Road to Nowhere came from. I grew up in a church, but I'm not a prominent church goer as of now. I honestly don't have any religious beliefs, I just think we should all try and be nice and treat everyone the same, basically don't be an idiot. One night a group of friends and I decided to go to the road to nowhere one night to have a creepy college experience. We arrive at the site and start walking up the road and everything is normal. We make it through the tunnel and to the other side and we all start to goof off and have fun. We were also waiting on the other side waiting for another group of friends that were coming in a different car. 
After about 30 minutes of being on the other side of the tunnel, I look back at the opening and see something that looks like someone holding a phone flashlight. Like you could see the silhouette of a person and everything, so I start calling out my friends' names and yelling inside jokes. I was immediately overcome with this feeling of dread. One, they were not moving. You know how you can tell when people are normal? Not being mean, but you can tell they are making the small movements of breathing and moving their hands in a more comfortable position. Two, they were not talking back to me. I also graduated with a degree having to do with the criminal justice system, so my immediate thought was that this was some maniac trying to hurt us. I turned around and told my friends we needed to leave, and right at that moment, the little phone flashlight shut off. Now I was really scared. People will try to knock your lights off so you can't see, and wanted everyone to get out before someone started to try and shoot at us. So we shine the light through the tunnel. We have a mag light flashlight because... The tunnel was the only way back to the car, and you could go over the tunnel, but you'd have to scale the mountain. Anyway, we make it through the tunnel into the parking lot. There are no other cars in the parking lot, and if anyone came down, you would have seen them. The trail marked the dead end of even the road to the state park. As we are making it to the car, we look back and everyone sees the same little light on the other side of the tunnel with the person just standing there. I honestly don't know if it was a spirit that used to live there, or maybe something else. Unfortunately, and I am usually a skeptic, this experience made me question so much about what goes bump in the night. I can assure you it is not humanly possible to scale this mountain. You can even look the place up, it's called the Road to Nowhere in North Carolina. It's free, it's public, and has all the same rules and regulations that state parks usually administer. So if you do plan on visiting, Please read their rules and see what kind of wildlife is around during that time of year. During college, I lived in a two-bedroom apartment with another roommate. She was nice, clean, and smart, so I really thought we would get along with each other. The first nine months of living together is fine, not even an argument about the dishes. Then, during the holidays, she went home like most students do. When she came back, she informed to tell me that she had brought back her mom's old Ouija board from when she was little. It wasn't a creepy board. It came in a box that looked like you got it from an 80s Toys R Us store. And to be fair, I honestly thought that they were just games. I'm still kind of skeptical, but I think they opened doors that shouldn't be opened. She got weird. She started to become mean, agitated and would stay in her bedroom playing with this board for hours. Dishes started to pile up, the living room area was always a mess. She did a total personality flip. The event that led me to believe that something paranormal happened was one day, while my roommate was in class and not in the apartment, I brought my boyfriend over after we got out of class so we could pack up to go hiking. My boyfriend sits his vape down on the table in the living room, these are college apartments, so all the furniture is the same and it's all cheap. And we walk to my room to start packing. When we get back, his vape is no longer on the table. And these tables were not fancy by any means. They were a small black coffee table that was metal and just had a tabletop and legs. There was no way to actually hide anything underneath it. We tear up the apartment, looking through everything, and are just about to give up. Then as we are talking, we turn around and the vape is sitting upright on the coffee table, where it originally was. It also seemed like the apartment was cold and it felt like the feeling when you know your parents are fighting in the room next door. Not exactly awkward, even though it is, but I guess you know the feeling. I'm not sure what to make of this experience and I cannot think of any logical explanation. I even had someone else see what happened. Any advice? So this was about two years ago. I was lying in bed on my stomach with my feet hanging off the foot of the bed from about mid-shin down. It was 3 a.m.-ish and my mind was finally starting to settle down to allow me to start heading off to sleep when I felt something weird. I don't know how else to describe it other than the generic cold feeling in the air when ghosts are around, but it just felt weird, like something had suddenly changed. 
but I was like, hmm, and I spread my legs to see if I could feel the shift of air or something that would explain that sudden coldness like a draft or something. And I kid you not, something poked me on the bottom of my foot. I'm talking a solid poke, and I swear I have never jumped out of bed so fast. I was expecting to see my roommates laughing, having snuck in to scare me, but there was nobody. I just tried to dismiss it and fall asleep so I could forget all about it, try to be rational because I didn't really believe in anything paranormal. A quick side note, I was on a queen-size mattress and a foot and a half away from the mattress edge. Now, I've had two or three experiences where I've felt one of my cats walking on my mattress right next to me, and you can just feel it, you know? In those times, I've either reached over to where I felt the cat was to pet it, only to find nothing, or known for a fact that we didn't have cats living with roommates, depending on whether it was my parents or after I moved out. Well, a couple of minutes after the foot poke thing, I'm laying down, I felt somebody pushing down on the bed with their hands right on the edge of the bed next to me. So at first I thought I felt something, then actually distinguishably that I did in fact feel something. Then it was pushing my mattress enough to make my body tilt in that direction, and I was in shock, just pure panic. It took about two seconds from the minutest amount of force to the greatest that made me open my eyes get my blanket and pillow, and get absolutely out of there to go join one of my roommates downstairs in the living room. Even now, I literally could not comprehend what actually happened, and the fact that it was about 3am didn't help. I'm quelling the matter knowing that 3am is the devil's hour, and there was a slightly similar scene in Emily Rose. It still messes with my head trying to wrap my mind around the fact that I experienced that, and I truly don't know what to make of it. That's my one and only paranormal encounter. Does anybody who's affluent in this realm of things have any input? What would it look like if we all listened more? Listening to audiobooks inspires us, motivates us, even brings us closer. And there's no better place to listen than Audible. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. And now Audible members get more than ever before. Each month they get three titles of their choice one audiobook, two Audible originals, and fitness programs that they can't get anywhere else. I myself have been working my way through Lullaby by author Jonathan Mayberry, narrated by Scott Brick. The fears and horrors of being a new parent take on a shocking dimension in this heart-stopping original story. A young married couple just bought a gorgeous house to escape the hustle and bustle of the city to raise their baby girl, Hope, in relative peace and quiet. When night falls, however... Their dream home becomes a house of nightmares. They soon learn that darkness takes many forms, and sometimes darkness is hungry. There's never been a better time to experience Audible. Try it for free for 30 days by visiting audible.com slash read or by texting read to 500-500. That's audible.com slash READ or by texting READ to 500-500. You can do it with audiobooks. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, our Let's Read Official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear it featured here on the channel. And join my Discord to interact with me directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.